So object-oriented programming and uh, functional programming are not enemies. Um, they're not even frenemies. They are uh, two tools that we can use at the same time. We can use uh, any of these. We're just thinking about our software and the way that our software reflects the things that we're trying to do and the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at like Smalltalk, which is the programming language on which um, object-oriented programming kind of you know uh, broke out and became a, uh, a a process and a way of thinking in itself, it started by um, some people asking the question, "How can we add um, dynamic binding to Lisp? How can we have a, a function that chooses what function to run at runtime?" Um, so these were functional programmers who then wanted a feature in functional programming and invented object-oriented programming. This is a quote from Randall Munro. Uh, it's completely context-free, but uh, that means that uh, it will definitely apply to this talk and indeed any other. We're going to go on a journey. We're going to look at how we can represent something using a function. And then we're going to uh, see how we can uh, break out of having a single function that represents something to a collection of functions. And then we're going to ask, well, can we have a function that represents that collection of functions? And we'll end up with some kind of object that, um, well, actually, I'll just call it an object um, for reasons that will become clear, hopefully, over the next quarter of an hour. I'm going to start with an assertion. And this is a bit mathematical and a bit philosophical. Um, that is that... If I have a thing and I know what I'm allowed to do to that thing and how it's going to behave when I do it, I have an entire definition of that thing. So on the left, we have a set. And the set is def defined as here is the universe. The universe is the big uh, blue rectangle. And inside that, this collection of um, you know, th th this small area inside the universe the things inside that are a set that we're going to call A. And this is what philosophers would call an extensional definition of this set. We're, we're defining it by example. Anything that is in this circle is the set. Everything that is in this circle is the set. On the right, we have a function um, that's uh, a type of function called a predicate. Um, it answers the question, is this thing uh, in this set. Well, in fact, what it does is it, uh, it takes a thing as an argument and returns true or false. If this function returns true for everything that's within that yellow circle and false for everything that's uh, outside the yellow circle, then that is what philosophers would call an intentional definition of the set. My point is that these are not two different ways to represent some like you know, underlying thing that is the set. My point is that both of these things are the set. They are the same thing. So because we're talking about object-oriented programming, we obviously have to have some ducks involved because things look like ducks and quack like ducks in OOP. So imagine that I just took every duck in the universe and I showed them to you one by one. I said, this is a duck. This is a duck. This is a duck. This is a duck. I'm, I'm going to stop there, but you get the idea. So by the time I've shown you every single duck that exists uh, in the universe, you know what the set of all ducks is. But that's going to take a long time. What I could equivalently do is um, give you a, a test for duckness. Uh, you know, maybe it's, does it walk like a duck, quack like a duck, uh, and have wings like a duck and swim on the water, or something like that. You know, I, uh, but if I had a test for duckness, that would define the set of all ducks in the same way as showing you every duck in the universe. Let me demonstrate how that works. So I've shown you every duck in the universe. Now imagine that I also show you everything else. This is not a duck. This is not a duck. This is not a duck. You are not a duck. This tree over here is not a duck. And I carry on uh, doing, uh, doing that. What we could build is a big table um, where we have on the left, in the left column, everything. And in the right column, we have a, uh, a true or a false, whether it's a duck or not. Now, I can very simply write a function that looks up in that table 
whether the right column is true or false for a given object. I've got a function that returns true for every duck in the universe and false for everything else. Now that I've got this signature and this behavior for this function, I can change the implementation. I can have a function that does something else, but that yields to the same results. I have got what looks from the outside world to be the same function. I have therefore still got a function that returns true for every duck, false for everything else. I have still got the set of all ducks. I have just defined it with a function. So here's some very simple functions. I could just uh, return false, and I've got the empty set. There is nothing in it. Anything that I ask, is this a function? Is this in the set? The answer is no. I've also got the universal set, because I can ask, uh, is this in the set, and just always return true. Um, so these are very trivial sets to write. Um, but we can see that they both have the same pattern. They take a thing, and they return um, a Boolean. They, they answer the question, is this thing in the set? These are sets. They are not functional representations of sets. They are not a function that tests for membership for something else that is a set. These are sets. And they look like this. All sets look like this. And everything that looks like this is a set. This is just a, a function signature that has the same signature as membership of a set. So I want some word that says, you know, to describe this idea that there's you know, a, a kind of abstract collection of things, like a classification. There is a class of sets. Why don't we just use the word class? So uh, what we have in the functional programming world is a type definition. And it's a class, because everything that conforms to that is an instance of some concept that we're talking about. The empty set and the, uh, the universal set are useful, but are not sufficient for doing work with sets. So let's have a think about how we could build some more interesting sets. And maybe we could have functions that return sets which because we're dealing with, um, uh, with sets that are functions, are higher order functions. They are functions that return functions. So here, we take uh, two parameters, a lower bound and a, an upper bound, and um, we capture those. So the thing that we're returning is a closure uh, that captures the arguments from the function that built it and uses those to configure the behavior of the set that we're looking at. And of course, we could go you know, uh, as deep into higher order land as we want. We could have sets that take sets and use those set memberships to tell us something about the set that we're looking at. So we can have a union by saying, I've got this set, and I've got this set, and I'm going to capture those. And anything that is in at least one of these sets is also in my union set. So what we've done in both of these cases is kind of taken this idea of setness, captured some information that's out there in the world and used that to configure a particular instance of a set. So we might want to call these things instance variables because if we look at the two uh, implementations, at the two uh, closures in there, they're both uh, using those to configure their own behavior. So these are the instance variables of those sets. And then we've got functions that are um, configuring these things, uh, setting up their instance variables, and then returning these in instances. So we might want to call these constructors. And you know, just because uh, we can go into a bit more um, depth and define some more words, the, uh, the lower example of a set itself uses sets, but doesn't care what the implementation of those sets are. It just cares that they conform to the interface. You know, the type signature is, uh, after all, an interface defining setness. So it's actually polymorphic over any implementation of a set. But you say, Graham, typically I would want to have more than one operation on an object. And what you've shown me is, um, is a set that is defined by a single function. What if I want a, a more complex type? Well, let's build up from one operation to two. Uh, just to show you that we don't need to only define one operation objects in our functional programming system. So a list is like a set that has order, right? There are things in it 
and they are in a particular sequence. So there are two operations. One is how many things are in this set, which has um, no arguments and returns a number, and the other is uh, what is the thing at this position, which takes an arg a, a number, and because I didn't say that the number has to be less than the, the count of things in the list, uh, we know that it has to optionally return a thing, because if I have a list of length three and I say what's the thing at position seven, there should not be a thing at position seven. So I need either empty or value, so I'm going to use an optional type. Now, it wouldn't do to just say, here is the collection of all of the count functions that I can build, and here is the collection of all of the at functions that I can build, and if I take one of these and one of those and put them together, then I have a list. That kind of intuitively doesn't make sense because like, at some level they need to share information. I need to know that the thing that is counting what's in the list is looking at the same things as the thing that is um, telling me what is at a, a given position. So I actually need to consider these things together. And in um, Swift, we might want to use a protocol to do that. Uh, so what it gives us is uh, a couple of names. One is count, one is at, and the ability to attach functions to those names. Equivalently, and you know, people uh, who are seasoned Swift programmers may say, well, these two things aren't equivalent at all. But hear me out. From a conceptual perspective, equivalently, I could build a structure that has a count function and an at function, and that tells me uh, what they are. I say that these are equivalent because what I'm doing at the moment is saying these two functions are associated and both describe the same thing. If I have this table, whether the table is defined by a protocol or by a structure, then it is a table of the, the two methods that are available on this list. If you want to um, have a discussion with me afterwards about whether associated types or generic types are better, worse, richer, poorer, different, the same, whatever, I probably won't have uh, very good um, answers for you, but we can at least you know, start that conversation. But what we've got in both of these cases is basically a table, um, which lets me select an operation on my list by, uh, by naming it, by saying I want the count um, method or I want the at method. These two things are both giving me selectors for the methods on my object. And they are both equivalent to just having a table where I can, on the left side I have the name of my function and on the right side I have the implementation of my function. Now that's quite interesting because what we saw before when we had the ducks was that if I have a table with the values on the left and the, uh, and the things that those values map to on the right, I can build a function that looks up those things in the table. Or equivalently, I can uh, replace that function with something else that has exactly the same behavior. So why do I need to have you know, a protocol or a structure here to give me the, the methods on my list? Why don't I replace this with a function? So I want to take my selectors, which are the names of these methods, and have some function that's going to return for me the implementations. Now, here is where this starts to look a bit different from if we were doing uh, object-oriented programming in something like uh, Objective-C or in Smalltalk or Ruby or some other language. Because with um, Swift's type system, my count function and my at function have different types. Actually, they do in those other languages. What um, Smalltalk and Ruby do is say there is one way to call a function. You build a list of the objects that are the arguments over here, and you get a return value that is an object over here. There's no problem. But Objective-C and Swift do care about the signatures of the method, which is why Objective-C has NS method signature, so that we can capture this information. We can capture it in Swift using a, uh, a tagged enumeration or a discriminated union or whatever word you would like to use for this concept. So now my list is a function that takes a list selector and gives me the implementation for the method. And this is uh, just dynamic binding of uh, functions. This is saying, 
choose at runtime the function that I'm going to run. This is message sending. We have now built object-oriented programming. But imagine that we wanted to add more and more methods, that we don't just want uh, sets that have one method and lists that have two methods. We want you know, more um, rich objects that have larger collections of methods on them. Well, let's not, you know, we could just a extend this list of selectors. That's going to get fairly dull. Um, so I'm going to jump straight from two to infinity uh, because, like, you know, why would we bother stopping at any of the other numbers except um, Graham's number? Because A, it's named after me. It's not named after me. Uh, it's named after someone who has the same name as me. Um, but also, it is a whopping huge number. And so if you can solve for, uh, numbers up to Graham's number, carrying on to infinity is just a detail after that. But uh, let's, let's just go all the way to infinity uh, and maybe beyond and just say that I can name my functions using strings because you know, a name is a name. Uh, they're typically in some, uh, you know, some language that is a written language, and strings are collections of characters which are great for representing the written language. So now I've just taken the same thing, and instead of having an enumeration of the selectors, I've got a string which names my selector. And now I've got this function that takes a selector and returns a method implementation. I may as well just call that an object at this point, because this is all that object-oriented programming is. It is looking up at runtime the function that I want to run. What we have to do because of uh, the way that types work in languages with decent type systems is that we still need to know what the method signature is, and we still need to destructure this. So the right-hand side of our table, our list of method implementations, is going to get long. It's not going to get very long, though. Because you know, if you think about it, uh, so Bertrand Meyer in the Eiffel programming language in about 1986 introduced this idea of command query separation. So I can separate everything into something that takes arguments and, return, and returns void because it's a command. Um, and I can turn arguments into an argument that is an object that re represents my arguments. So I need a thing that takes an argument and returns nothing. I need a query, which is the thing that takes nothing and returns a value. And then maybe I want to break back into the Swift type system somehow. So I might want like a description selector that takes uh, an object and returns a string, or I might want like to be able to convert them into integers so that I can do Swift maths or into floats so that I can represent them on the screen or something. But it's going to be a very small list of implementation types. And now we can build the message send function, which is just running the object as a function given its selector and getting the method that I want to execute. This is actually, uh, this is kind of flipped the way the uh, Objective-C message send works. Because it, with Objective-C message send, we say all of the functions, the methods are defined in classes over here. And if they're not, then we go into this thing called forward invocation that lets us run some code. In this case, I'm saying, let's just go straight to the run code bit, because that is the thing that gives objects agency. So uh, in summary, an object is just a function. It um, closes over the instance values that were passed by its constructor. It maps method selectors to method implementations. It, all that an object is is a way to pick functions at runtime. So we can build objects out of functions in Swift, and indeed did so in 18 minutes. Thanks very much. <laughs>